Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Will's Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wills. As followers of the Unshackled and uh, Unshackled Productions would be aware, we provide in-depth coverage of political events from our South Pacific Anglosphere neighbour New Zealand. The main forum for this is Trad Tasman Talk, which I co-host uh, with Guri De Boer every Tuesday evening, 7 p.m. Melbourne time on the Unshackled YouTube channel. Uh, myself and Dewey, we get along well uh, both on and off air, and we have, a, as, as you can see, have a good on-air uh, rapport. Uh, but it's always good to get other perspectives about the, the news and political culture in New Zealand. Uh, Due being a, a tradcon or traditionalist conservative obviously has certain biases. So tonight we're looking at uh, New Zealand society and politics from a libertarian perspective with my guest, Stephen Berry. He hosts the Mr. Berry, Mr. Berry show, and he has been active in New Zealand in the New Zealand Libertarian Movement for a number of years and has also been a candidate of their Libertarian Act Party in the past. Uh, it's one of the world's most successful Libertarian parties who returned to their glory days in the 2020 general election, winning 10 seats in New Zealand's 120-seat parliament. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. And I appreciate you coming on such uh, late in the evening over in, well, you're in the uh, the glorious city of Auckland at the moment where you can, or just like cities here in Australia, particularly Melbourne, you can be snapped back into lockdown at a, at a moment's notice. Yeah, and who knows when that's going to happen again. Um, we've been surprised with our two alert level threes within three weeks, just over the past month, so... Well, at, at, at least with uh, New Zealand's alert levels, uh, Jacinta Ardern, uh, she has stuck to the, the various rules in the alert level processes, so you know exactly what the rules are going to be if you go to alert level two, three or four. Well, in Australian states and territories, whatever lockdown or restrictions, it's just made up on the go. They're, 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 they're never, they're, there's never much consistency they're they're never the same and so we sort of i interpret uh, the the various restrictions as say level 2.9 or 3.8 or whatever we have had an alert level 2.5 once before um but i mean weren't we all just making it up on the first lockdown anyway um, oh. those were actually illegal for the first nine days yes well there's been a lot there's been decent amount of challenges to to both the the victorian prolonged 112 day lockdown and the uh the the state border closures uh, but uh, so far none of it has found to be illegal by our courts they don't seem to want to rock the boat on what they seem is a a a political uh, decision uh, with uh, also uh, implications with regard to uh, health directives so they're they're, 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 they've basically just rubber stamped whatever state and federal governments have done. Yeah, um, but despite the consistency in New Zealand's um, lockdown approaches, it doesn't really sink through to the populace anyway. Um, every time there's a warning of an alert level change, the supermarket queues explode, and yet we know that um, supermarket trading isn't interrupted at all by these lockdowns. So uh, I, don't, I don't know whether it makes a hell of a lot of difference. Oh, but there's still the panic buying before in the hours leading up to the uh, a lockdown coming into uh, effect. Uh, I saw with the, the the latest Auckland lockdown that so it's your main uh, supermarket over there is is Countdown, uh, which is well, it's the the equivalent of Woolworths over here. There were the the people with trolleys all out the front wanting to empty out the place. Yeah, exactly. And and that doesn't seem to change um, any time, despite the consistency in the lockdown rules. Now, your show is called uh, Mr. Berry, Mr. Berry. Now, why two Mr. Berries in the in the in the title? Because it does roll off the tongue. Well, when you say Mr. Berry, Mr. Berry, it, it, there's a lot of energy in it. And watching your, <laughs> your shows, it starts you off on an energetic path. 
Yeah, well, um, despite it, uh, some accusations, it's not an homage to Pokemon, um, but uh, it's actually about maybe 20 years ago when the Dr. Zayas um, Simpsons episode came out, um, it kind of got adapted into a nickname, uh, Mr. Berry, Mr. Berry. And uh, when when I was trying to come up with show ideas about a, uh, 12 months ago, that, that's the one that came first to mind. Um, I think the most uh, annoying part about the name, for me anyway, was uh, having that theme song stuck in my head constantly throughout the day. And that's when I knew I had to have Mr. Berry, Mr. Berry as a theme song. And, and then, uh, sp speaking of, uh, of cartoon uh, memes, uh, the, uh, South Park, uh, during their 2016 election season, had the, the member berries. Okay, no, I, I I don't know anything about that. You don't know the the, the member berries uh, the, because they the the mem the reason that people were voting for well in 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 the, in the South Park election, Mr. Garrison, who was the stand-in for for for, Do for Donald Trump, is because they when eating the member berries, they remembered how good things were back in the the the, the old days, and the the member berries spoke as as well. Oh well, well, I've totally got to watch it now. <laughs> yes, you do. I'm surprised you didn't know that. No, no, you you would think I'd be quite a close watcher of South Park episodes. I guess that's the oh, you you could call that a, a advantage or a disadvantage of having a a fruit for a last name. My my last name, Wilms. Well, a lot of people can't even pronounce that, but it's just a old school German name. There's not much else to it. Yeah, and having Barry as a surname is, well, that didn't do me any favours in the schoolyard, that's for sure. Uh, I, I could probably uh, uh, picture it. <laughs> yeah, well, um, there's, there's all sorts of puns that you can make up with, with uh, Barry, and most of them are not very complimentary, uh, but I, I won't. I'll leave that for other people to do. <laughs> well, you 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 decided as uh, a lot a, a, a lot of people uh, who are disparaged in that way to just uh, own it and make it your own. Yeah, so I guess I should be glad that I'm not called the C word like another one of our politicians because I wouldn't want to have to own that one. <laughs> uh, I think there's a, a lot of politicians who uh, are called that word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's not special. <laughs> but uh, I, the the show title I settled on tonight, I thought it had to be a berry pun, so I chose Liberty Berry as a as a pun for Liberty Bell. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, that's well chosen. Um, but yeah, I, I I couldn't really think of any any myself, so I even googled it. Now. Oh, first before first before I proceed with the next question, a super chat has come up on the Entropy uh, YouTube Enhanced software from Senator Slayer for five Australian dollars, and he says, "Great show, Tim. I'm sure you'll get more success after your recent changes." Yes, if uh, if you're following the the, the chat and uh, if uh, other regulars are. I decided to, to unban uh, a few people. Well, <laughs> unban uh, a person with multiple accounts just to sort of, well, mix up the chat a, chat a bit. Let's see if that experiment w uh, <laughs> is a success, but it's certainly a lively chat. Yeah, it seems to be moving well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, let's talk about... Uh, I. Spo uh, oh, well, I introduced the party in my introduction, the, the ACT Party in New Zealand, which, as I said, it's one of the, the world's most successful libertarian parties. And uh, it, uh, it, it returned to the, the, the New Zealand Parliament uh, with, a, with a strong showing after a, a period in the, the wilderness. And, uh, well, my basic analysis of it is well when the when a nation is turned into a police state when other freedoms are on the the chopping block and uh, the uh, the nation's economy is uh, going back on the road to serfdom then the general public who 
basically took a lot of their existing freedoms for granted, they they see merit in, yeah, we did like that liberty and uh, are more open to voting for a libertarian political party. Yeah, and it started with the free speech issue in 2018 when Lauren Southern and Stefan Molyneux uh, visited the country. They got kicked out of the Bruce Mason Theatre by... Uh, yes, I remember that. Yeah, Phil Goff claimed it was his idea, but it was actually already decided before he opened his mouth about it. Um, and that's so that was the first um, liberty issue that really captured the public's imagination. Um, there were a lot of free speech examples uh, going over that six-month period. We had um, Chelsea Manning, uh, Nigel Farage, Dom Brash, uh, Clementine Ford, who I find quite horrendous, all very different characters, uh, but ACT was actually the only parliamentary political party that uh, stood up for free speech for all of them, whereas the other parties had their own personal prejudices. Uh, National was very vocal on behalf of Don Brash, their former leader, uh, very quiet on others and actually openly hostile to Chelsea Manning. So that was the first liberty issue that really helped act. And then the uh, really horrendous process on the crackdown on guns in New Zealand is what uh, fed the rest of Act's uh, explosion in popularity. Uh, David Seymour was the only person in Parliament who would have voted against it going uh, through the emergency process. Um, unfortunately, he missed the vote, but there was a bit of trickery going on between the Speaker and the Labour Party, and he was standing outside talking to media when the vote should have happened. Uh, but I, that doesn't seem to have really impacted on X support as a result. In fact, perhaps it even did it some favours because there was so much focus on the one MP who stood up against the rest of the mob in Parliament. Um, in terms of uh, more people being attracted to a libertarian party. Acts a bit of a conundrum in the sense that it's a libertarian party, but it's got its membership is conservative. Um, and uh, during my time in there, I would often um, notice the difference between the leadership and the board and the candidates versus its, its members. Uh, but it's... It, Probably a combination of ACT being more visible on uh, freedom issues, but it's also uh, what tends to happen in New Zealand's political environment when the National Party goes through a dark period and um, the smaller right-wing parties then go on the ascendancy. And we saw the same thing in the, in the late 90s when MMP first came into New Zealand. Um, ACT had its best result in 2002 with nine MPs when National had its worst result ever. Then in 2005, um, National uh, was on the ascendancy again with Don Brash being the leader and ACT only got two MPs. I went to uh, New Zealand, well, when we, we did have uh, free international travel during the, the 2017 general election and i have to say during that time i wasn't that impressed with uh, david seymour and act at that time he seemed quite cringe and he was trying all these different sort of stunts to to get noticed uh, but he's really t blossomed you would say or risen uh, to the the occasion to to stand up for uh, for freedom. You, you mentioned the, because you, uh, I recall, had tickets to go and see S Stefan Molyneux and, and Lauren Southern there, and you didn't get to see, get, get, get to see them in, in Auckland. But obviously the, the Christchurch massacre in, in March 2019 changed a lot uh, because it was uh, perpetrated by an Australian uh, there was uh, a lot of uh, scrutiny and calls to crack down on nationalist and and far and far right groups in Australia, but uh, over in New Zealand, uh, well, Jacinda Ardern said pretty early that uh, she was going to make New Zealand gun laws the same as Australia, and well, also crack down on free speech as well. So that's when 
David Seymour and Act, uh, pardon the pun, got their, their act together. And uh, in 2020, he was one of the, the lone uh, voices against the uh, Ardern government's uh, tyranny when it came to the lockdown and their various uh, mismanagement. Yeah, you know, it's and that wasn't unique either. Um, the um, ACT Party was the only vote in opposition to uh, government votes at least a third of the time in Parliament. Uh, the child poverty bill would be another example. Um, not very well named because all it's done is measure the increase in child poverty. Um, but my um, issue with National for many, many years has been that it's indistinguishable from Labour. It's probably the more competent version of the Labour Party. Um, and I guess it was inevitable that voters would eventually identify that, especially uh, once the centre-right went into opposition. Uh, that's, I, I, there's usually a trend in New Zealand politics as well, uh, with the exception of the Greens in 2020, for junior coalition partners to get decimated in the following elections. And that was definitely an issue for the ACT Party um, when they went into coalition with National in 2008. There were five ACT MPs. Then in the following three subsequent elections, just one MP each. So uh, going into opposition was probably the best thing that ever happened to the ACT Party in 2017, I think. Now, the, the ACT Party, it, it has been a, a, politi a political force uh, for well, nearly three decades now. I, uh, emerging from the, the beginning of New Zealand's uh, foray into mixed member uh, proportionate. Uh, but uh, the, the reason it was probably able to achieve such a comeback is because, well, it had strong foundations uh, that it was uh, founded uh, by well, key players in New Zealand's uh, revolution in the, the 1980s away from socialism towards uh, libertari libertarianism, notably uh, the Labor Finance Minister Roger Douglas, and uh, he is well, you could call him his right hand man, uh, Richard uh, Preble. Yeah, and that's, that was part of a movement that was taking place globally, really. Um, the UK, Australia, USA, uh, Eastern Europe, um, to differing degrees, all went down the same path towards the more free market approach. And why would you not, looking at the absolute catastrophe that government bureaucracy was across the world, uh, problems with um, excessively strong unions, um, government ownership of just about every utility, controls on um, the, the, the volume and the amount of goods that you could bring in through a border. I mean, um, I could never possibly list all, all the crushing regulations that impacted New Zealand economically and the same around the world. So as we've gotten uh, further down the line from that past, so we're, that's almost 40 years ago now that that Labour government was elected, uh, people either have short memories or they weren't even alive at the time. And both. Now, yeah, yeah. So now people are quite happy to... Uh, bag on Rogernomics and the market experiment, but nobody's happy to go back to six week waiting lists uh, to get a phone line or um, regulations on how far trucks can travel on the motorway in order to um, boost volume of goods on railways, etc. So um, in 1996, you know, people remembered uh, what a difference the free market reforms had made to the long term prosperity of New Zealand, despite the initial um, tough times, which always happens when you remove um, an artificial distortion from the economy, such as a government of that size. The reason why it's called a revolution in New Zealand, and you're right that it was a, a, a free market revolution across the Western world, but New Zealand went from the, the absolute most highly regulated, centrally managed economy without actually being openly socialist communist to pretty much in the by the mid 1990s uh, the one of, one of the most free market places dare i say libertarian 
paradise and it was continued in the, the early 90s by the, the national government, which is the centre-right party uh, of that nation, by uh, two uh, women, uh, because, uh, because uh, New Zealand uh, is known for its uh, female leaders and they're, they're on the right as well, Ruth Richardson, the, the finance minister, with her, was dubbed Ruth in Asia, and uh, uh, Jenny Sh Shipley as well, who was, uh, was it social services minister? Yeah, that's right. But achieving, because uh, she brought down Ruth Richardson, what was called the, the mother of all budgets in 1991, which uh, cut welfare significantly. And I was sort of thinking 30 years on, there's no way that you could deliver a budget like that today in this age and be able to sell it and implement it. Um, I, and I think that's been the case for all the big free market reforms in New Zealand. Um, the 1984 Labor government didn't run on a free market platform during that election campaign. It had no idea what a mess the government books were, and nobody knew because the government wasn't required to publish the books at that time. So when they were elected, they inherited um, a broke government, a foreign exchange crisis, um, the need to devalue the dollar by 20%. So uh, basically everything that they'd run on in that election was thrown out the window and for the better of course um, and it was the same with the national government that was elected in 1990 they didn't run on the mother of all budgets uh, they ran on getting rid of the superannuation surcharge and returning to a decent society where the government um, wasn't so cold and clinical uh, yet once elected they did the complete opposite and thank fuck for that <laughs> Though so, uh, the, the national prime minister from that time, Jim Bolger, he is mellowed in his uh, old, older years now and says that neoliberalism has failed and we need to give power back to the unions. Yeah, uh, what, a, what an idiot. Maybe, maybe he's just got, uh, got soft in the head as a result of more government handouts because he's <laughs> worked for New Zealand Post now. I believe he's worked for Kiwi Bank. Um, and then he was in the working party in which they were deciding how to return um, e employment relations back to the 1970s, in which all industries were required to negotiate together to achieve a um, single uh, level playing field of conditions. So um, I, it's, it's just like, you know, uh, the Organisation for Dentists has spoken up in the last couple of days about wanting a sugar tax. Um, they're not politicians, they're not economists, um, they should stick to teeth because all they really uh, have in this um, argument is their hand out for some government money and that really changes people's uh, outlooks on life, I think. Uh, uh, we had a, a former uh, Liberal Prime Minister over here, Malcolm Fraser, who or had had a similar mellowing in his older years to, to Jim Bolger. Malcolm Fraser, I think his last act uh, before he, he died in 2015 was uh, advocating the re-election of uh, Green Senator Sarah Hansen Young. Oh, how ghastly. <laughs> yes. Now, in Australia, our uh, main libertarian party well, which is the closest to, to libertarian values and principles is the the liberal democrats or liberal democratic party is their their, their full name obviously they burst onto the uh, political scene with uh, senator david linehelm elected in in 2013 and uh, he was quite a, a polarizing person uh, not 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 just in the the, the media but amongst uh, other libertarians as well certainly he was my type of of, of libertarian and so i certainly uh, enjoyed some of his antics uh, but uh, he left in 2019 uh, there uh, though there were two liberal democrat mps who got elected in victoria in uh, 2018 uh, david limbrick and and tim quilty uh, and 
the Victoria, as you're well aware, is known as the, the, the Socialist People's Republic of Victoria because of our far left socialist premier, Dan Andrews. Now, well, the education states, the number plates tell me. <laughs> yes, there's been lots of puns on that, the, the lockdown state. I think one of our slogans was also the smart state. I don't think that's true either. Well, Margaret Thatcher always said, if you have to tell people you're a lady, you're not. Well, what's a lady anymore? Though? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like Margaret Thatcher was ahead of her time in that regard. She definitely was. Well, they didn't get much traction uh, for the first year and a half of their election because basically it was just uh, business uh, or government business as usual. The, uh, the, the local media it basically doesn't ask many tough questions of, of Dan and his government. And that was until 2020 and until the, uh, the second wave and 112 day lockdown caused by the, the, gov the Andrews government's incompetence with, with hotel quarantine. And, and, and since then, uh, well, uh, but David Limbrick in particular have uh, ha have uh, received both extensive coverage and extensive uh, praise, particularly from the the new uh, freedom freedom activists here and anti lockdown uh, activists here, and uh, Tim Quilty. He is from the uh, the border uh, Victorian border city of Wodonga, which borders on Albury in New South Wales, and so for a lot of 2020 that uh, those twin twin cities were divided in in half and so he was very good at advocating for like look you've got Wodonga which is completely locked down and then had ridiculous mask rules and that why Albury it's pretty much uh, everyone's just getting on with with life so they've certainly I I, I believe followed the 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 Seymour uh, model in but it also takes rising to the occasion as well because you have to remember that uh the the lockdowns and the the follow the science uh, follow the health ad advice is still incredibly popular so even though a lot of libertarians have their, their 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 principles and values there are still plenty that are too scared to proclaim them loudly especially during the the, the pandemic so it still takes both a, a charismatic and principled politician to get the message out there and grow a libertarian party. Yeah, um, Seymour's been a bit disappointing on this issue to me. Um, he's actually advocating for compulsory um, contact tracing. For, yes, I saw uh, that. Bluetooth. I mean, it's, I guess it's tempting um, in this sort of situation when um, opposing lockdowns is such a desert um, in the wilderness for the politicians. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not going to be that critical because he is obviously a politician and that's the way it works over there. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, it can be very counterintuitive to advocate for uh, freedoms that we have enjoyed and should continue to enjoy when it seems so logical from a voter's perspective that people staying in their homes while there's a pandemic going around uh, the country probably will stop it spreading. Um, my concern is always that when the pandemic goes away, how many of those freedoms are we going to get back? Um, I would argue not all of them. Even in New Zealand, on under level one, which is the lowest alert level, um, you now have to wear a mask on public transport, and that's just been accepted. And it started off just in Auckland, now that's around the entire country. Uh, same thing when you're flying in a plane around the entire country now. You yeah, same here in Australia as well. Yeah, and it's a, it's a small thing, and you look like a jerk for opposing that because the general consensus is that a mask will make it less likely that you'll pass on uh, this disease. But that, that's always a tricky thing for libertarians because politics isn't about principles or anything um, 
well, nothing like that at all. Uh, it's, it's about popularity and votes. And on the whole, voters are very trusting of their democratic governments in the West. Um, too trusting. Yes. It, it, yeah, Even no, still, I mean, a year later. Have a good, yeah, our governments do have a good record on um, not overextending their hand unless it's a, it seen to be absolutely necessary. I mean, in World War Two, we accepted food rationing and conscription. Um, and then things returned to much they, the way they were once the economy had recovered from World War Two. And so I guess that's kind of the same mentality that we're seeing with COVID as well. Um, these restrictions look reasonable to people. Um, they've lived in a system in which the government has generally been quite uh, reserved in exerting power, despite the fact that New Zealand's a unicameral legislature and there's very few checks and balances on our parliament. Um, so they, they don't see a danger in being over exuberant about uh, squashing out COVID with uh, legislation. You mentioned, and I already knew that uh, David Seymour was uh, advocating for compulsory uh, QR codes, and uh, this uh, th this is the sort of a a trade off uh, that has been sold to Australians that. Uh, I, to avoid lockdowns, this centralised QR code system is the best way, and this is why uh, New South Wales under Gladys Berejiklian has been able to remain open because they've got this centralised QR code contact tracing database. But uh, I get the suspicion, the fact that David Seymour proposed that, that obviously he's buoyed by the ACT Party's success, and he is feeling that, hey, maybe we could become the official opposition. And so obviously, if you have to do that, you have to go to uh, go a bit towards the centre. Yeah, I mean, it's been um, a much more effective opposition than the National Party since at least, well, since 2017, when both of them were thrown into opposition. Um, one MP against another 119 um, scored some remarkable wins and the euthanasia law changes that were passed into law uh, in the referendum last year stand testament to his abilities and that of Brooke Van Belden as well who is now deputy leader but at the time was working on his parliamentary staff um, but he's I guess you, you you've always got to keep expanding your um, your I think it's called a, a minimum winning coalition of support. Um, clearly, there's a limit on how far uh, gun supporters will get you and free speech supporters. And you've got to be looking for otherwise other ways to expand the tent. Um, it, taking an extreme uh, libertarian approach on lockdown um, politically is probably one of the stupidest things you could possibly do. Um, so. Yeah, it's not a huge surprise to see that he's he's um, gone down this path on the um, compulsory contact oh, tracing. Uh, uh, it, it's not unreasonable to, I, I, I think, say, hey, we shouldn't lock down over, over one case, which, well, Auckland has done and so have various Australian cities as well. Yeah, um, and if you have a look at the anti-lockdown movement, um, most of the personalities um, don't, let me put this tactfully, they don't appear to represent mainstream New Zealand. Um, I, they've been holding liberty rallies against the lockdown and my first instinct was, oh, awesome, the, uh, the, the movement's going to grow. And then you see those rallies and the last thing you would want to do is to be seen by somebody you know standing next to one of those people. There is also the the, the argument uh, that a libertarian party should have a, a should be open to a, a as broad a base as possible and not not always so conscious about media optics because well it's it's well obviously. The, the, the most important thing for uh, political parties, the basics, is to remain registered, make sure that there's some finance uh, coming in, especially towards uh, election time. And so you don't want to exclude 
a, a vast majority of people, even uh, some people who'd necessarily be be fringe, because there's libertarianism being a political ph ph philosophy. Uh, there's people who have all since it's only a political philosophy. There's people who have all sorts of values, all sorts of of views, and this is also why a lot of libertarian parties fall apart or just go in one direction and alienate everyone else. Yeah, yeah, because the entire party looks like an anti-lockdown protest. Um, but having been a, now being retired from politics, yeah, I've I've been in the position of uh, wanting to keep um, your party and its processes and its policies as, as pure as possible, but accepting the political reality that 99% um, of voters don't actually know what a libertarian is and they really don't know yes. how consistent the um, philosophy of the party that they've never heard of is. Um, so there's there's a political reality and uh, compromises that have to happen all the time there. Um, but at least, you know, now I get to point it out without getting in trouble. <laughs> but if you take Ron Paul, for example, who, well, he created what was the, the first libertarian moment uh, worldwide he still was open to, to going on alex jones's radio program who well it, it, who even back then was well he he, he still had quite a significant media pr uh, presence and was described as a person who never seen a conspiracy theory you didn't like and but for ron paul like getting the message out to uh, an audience and speaking to somebody who was somewhat sympathetic even though he believed in all of these conspiracies was still it was still a net gain yeah um ron, ron paul's was quite a uniquely american phenomenon i think um i guess we have our uh vinnie eastwood would be our alex jones equivalent in new zealand and i've worked with vinnie in the past too because there's things that we agree on um especially when um auckland uh, auckland was rocked by uh, it's pants down Len Brown mayor in 2013. Oh, um, what was that? Tell me more. Oh, so uh, just a few. Um, so I ran in the 2013 Auckland mayoral elections, and about two days after the results were announced, it emerged that uh, Len Brown had been screwing uh, one of his aides in the town hall. And um, I believe she was also running for a local board in that election too. So that that just exploded two days afterwards. Well, and, sex, um, he, sex he, and he politics are a perfect mix. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he wouldn't resign and there was no mechanism to make him resign in Auckland either. So for the next three years of his term, um, there was always this uh, thing hanging over him about being the filthy mayor who screws around with staff in the office so uh, not nice to be him that's for sure well we're stuck with uh, daniel andrews as as premier who's well screwed victorians uh, for the past <laughs> year uh until uh november 2022 when the next state election is is due uh, i think you're referencing there's no recall mechanisms in australia and and new zealand uh, but uh, thankfully we don't have to see uh dan's mean mug on the the tv since his uh fall and trip down the the stairs a week and a half ago he's out of action for at least six weeks hmm. but um you mentioned ron paul before and um i i you know got all excited about the uh, prospects of libertarianism and uh, 2011 during those primary campaigns as well, and so and that's when I got back into Parliament. Uh, sorry, politics after um, a hiatus of about six years, ran as an independent in Tamaki on a um, highly libertarian, pure libertarian platform, thinking if I just spent enough money, that might make all the difference. And it didn't. It was the worst. It was the worst result I've ever achieved. Um, so I came to the conclusion that Ron Paul is unique. A uniquely American uh, phenomenon because of the history that America has being founded as um, the closest we've ever seen to a libertarian nation in human history. 
I look at it differently in that the same way that uh, the ACT Party uh, uh, cap uh, capitalised on well the, the rise of big government and the suppression of freedom in from 2017 to, to 2020 and went from one MP to, to 10, Ron Paul in 2008 tapped into uh, the, well, the war fatigue that America was experiencing after the, uh, the Bush war years uh, also the the, well, uh, the the war at home the the drug war the fact that uh, u.s police swat teams were uh, 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 go uh, over overzealously uh policing uh drug uh, possession and also the the financial crisis which he pointed out that no it's not these it, 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 it's not uh, capitalism that's run a market. So you've got to look at what the Fed has done during this time. He, because to my mind, libertarianism only becomes appealing in a crisis point when there's a crisis and a libertarian party or candidate politician says the reason things are this way is because of this, and then there's more light bulbs or revelation that go go on in 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 people's head that's that's sort of why i put down to ron paul's popularity in 2008 which lasted until about 2015 over in the us yeah and in new zealand um, the national government dealt with that by maintaining social spending and running deficits for six or seven years um and act uh, I guess experimented at a stage with um, liberalism on drug laws. Um, it, it was it was a weird middle position, having no official political party, but having everyone who's publicly associated with the party speaking in favour of drug law reform. Um, and Don Brash in 2011 uh, brought up the issue of legalising cannabis during that election campaign. Um, and it, those... Um, putting those issues together with a libertarian party with a conservative membership actually really hurts the party. And I found in subsequent elections, um, the euthanasia issue really did hurt ACT at the polls. Um, what few support it was attracting at the time um, was also really muddied by people who would otherwise be considered traditional ACT voters being put off by uh, li liberal comments on cannabis or euthanasia, and the the the, the cannabis referendum that failed to get up in in twenty twenty, I was uh, uh, informed by Douay that was basically because the 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 legalized cannabis campaign it was it was basically that meme dude weed legal weed, which <laughs> do it doesn't really wash with. The, the the majority of well, citizens of any country. No, um, the the prime minister wouldn't back it. Um, she only admitted to supporting it after the vote had been lost. Um, I I agree with those who say that um, her refusal to be committal probably did hurt the referendum. Um, but the, the law that was being proposed was an absolute mess anyway. It was over-regulated to the point where you could barely see the benefit in legalising it because there's so many bloody regulations to comply with. But we, even the regulations we knew about were just uh, a small part of um, the speculation on what it could end up being because a lot like Brexit, um, this was being voted on before we even had a concrete objective idea of what it would actually mean. Now, with the ACT Party going from a sole MP, David Seymour, to, to 10, obviously there's these nine uh, new uh, strangers in Parliament uh, advocating for, well, um, well the, 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 the most, well, they're, they're the most closest to libertarian advocates in the parliament now. How does that, uh, because I know that uh, when uh, MMP was first introduced and you have what is termed party lists, uh, where MPs are elected as basically agents of the party, there was, what's the word for it again, when they quit basically within six months and oh, formed like another, 
Yes, yes. So now there's legislation to deal with that now, but that still doesn't prevent basically a new MP getting a big head thinking that they, they can run the show and freelance and do whatever. Yeah, I'm not sure if the legislation's still in effect. Um, don't hold me to that. And previously it's been introduced. Um, that was at the behest of the Alliance Party um, early in the century uh, as a result of their party falling apart due to defections. And New Zealand First um, brought it back in in 2017 because uh, they had been destroyed by defections in the past as well. So I, I'm not sure if it had a sunset clause this time, though previously it has done. Um, but... Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a little bit tricky in the sense that as a list MP, you're really elected um, by the party as opposed to being elected by a an electorate. Um, so how, how can you claim to be um, elected personally and then go and be independent of, of the party when you've been elected on a party list? There's, there's always that sort of conundrum in it and i guess yeah you could you could make a strong argument for the claim that these list mps are really hamstrung by being on the party list and uh, almost obligated to vote with the party each time and not rock the boat but i i don't want that from a politician um, elected into parliament i want them to do what they think is right even if it is stupid <laughs> now how does a how are lists uh, party list decided so the nine new act mps how did they get elected to their positions on the the party list which ultimately saw them enter the the parliament how does the internal democracy like work for each party um the greens have a highly um quota based um requirement for their mps which are must also be um, voted on the party list by the membership and they have to have a certain proportion of Māori, gays, uh, women, men, blah, blah, blah. Um, the ACT Party system, they do have a member ballot where the members can vote, uh, choose their top 20 candidates for the list and that's taken into consideration when the board decides what the list is going to be, but um, then ultimately the board makes a decision on who the list is. Um, legally, parties are required to have some sort of democratic system for creating their list, um, but it doesn't specify exactly what it must be. Uh, who elects the, the board of ACT? Uh, the party membership does. Each there's, I think there's currently seven um, board representatives plus the president, uh, vice president and the party leader. There may be, there's, I think there's probably an MP representative as well, but that was never an issue during my time. <laughs> um, and they're, they're elected for two year terms and ultimately the board makes the final decision on what the party list will be. Uh, in Australian political parties, it's basically up to the, the parties themselves, how they uh, govern themselves they can either be completely democratic or they can be extremely highly centralized in the or it's called executive in uh, australia uh, and obviously there can, there's different sorts of indirect uh, de democracies as well where you elect a delegate who then elects a candidate or elects goes on so forth uh, and that uh, internal I I internal party uh, democracy and voting that's uh, that that's almost as contentious here in australia as actual voting yeah and the australian system is already extraordinarily complicated from an outsider's perspective um, i mean i i'm extremely interested in electoral systems um, and I find the Australian system quite confusing, especially because there's there's actually multiple different voting systems per state, um, per council, yes. uh, federal elections, and then it's compulsory, and I'm going, why the fuck would you want to force people to participate in this extremely confusing exercise? And then you end up with, I don't know, the um, old automobile party or... Motoring Enthusiast Party, that That's was right, yeah. 
the the 2013 federal election, which was the the last federal election where the senators were elected with what's termed group voting tickets, where you put uh, voters, most voters just put a one above the party box rather than filling out one to 78, and yep. the party decides who uh, who the preferences go to. And so all the minor and micro parties were all doing preferences with each other in the hope that one of them would get elected. And obviously uh, what, uh, uh, some uh, parties were better at uh, uh, doing the preferences than others. And uh, if you were able to employ the service of Glenn Drury, who is known as the preference whisperer, uh, he, he uh, would be able to make sure that if the stars aligned uh, in a particular uh, a particular state or Senate region, uh, you could get elected even if your primary vote was only 1%. So yes, in that 2013 federal election that, yeah, Ricky Muir from the Motoring Enthusiast Party in uh, Tasmania, that was also the election that uh, Clive Palmer uh, got uh, four, was it, was it four senators? If I, three, three senators. Uh, so, uh, but wasn't, yeah. sorry, wasn't the guy from One Nation who then defected to form the National Conservative Party? Fraser Anning, uh, yes, he yeah, was elected he on a countback because he was elected on a countback. He was third on the ticket, so hardly anyone voted for him below the line. But because enough uh, voted for One Nation above the line, and he was next in line because Malcolm Roberts was found ineligible during the the dual citizenship uh crisis which what was it uh a, a new zealand uh labor mp was uh, accused of being part of that uh plot to was it, was it again uh, asking about yeah ba asking about uh, barnaby joyce's citizenship or sort of asking without asking yeah so you've got a very complicated political system which is then compulsory for people to participate in um you have a hard enough time selling uh working out what the policies are of 25 different parties uh on top of remembering what their preferences are <laughs> well it's only the victorian upper house and the west australian upper house which still have those group voting tickets mm. now at the the federal level it's optional preferential in the in the federal senate so above the line you you uh, can num it can number one to how many above the line or you can number below the line and it's optional so you can go one to six above the line or one to twelve below the line or number them all uh, if you like but that also a, because a party basically has to get a, a close to a full quota to have any chance of being elected, which is 14.3%. Uh, the only winners last uh, federal federal election from the, the minor party scene were One Nation, Malcolm Roberts returning to the, the Senate, and Jackie Lambie, who, well, she got elected uh, via Clive Palmer's United Australia Party in 2013, then defected, did the what you call it over in New Zealand, I can't pronounce it, uh, and became an independent, formed a Jackie Lambie network. And so she's been able to gain her political following off his coattails ever since. Mm. Um, and before the show, I was discussing um, how much I like the political culture in Australia. It's very bold, it's very blunt, um, it's quite offensive sometimes, which... Uh, it's also much more toxic and the, yeah. the the cultural left have the ascendancy and if you saw my my introduction uh, you'll understand why this is despite the fact that uh, supposedly most of our media is owned and controlled by the the evil far-right news corp murdoch media empire and apparently that's why new zealand politics is so kind with prime ministers like Jacinta Ardern because there's no Murdoch media over there. <laughs> yeah, well, there's not a lot of media competition at all. Um, and what what there is, is uh, receiving bailouts from the government as a result of lockdown. Another $50 million over the next three years was announced this year. And uh, I'm not sure if you followed in Australia how the uh, the Morrison government went into to bat for the mainstream media and extracting 
money from Facebook. Uh, they, uh, Facebook were, it is, well, they, they have now made deals with the Australian media companies to pay them for the, the, the for Facebook providing traffic to the mainstream media websites. You see how perverse yeah. that is. Yeah, I did. I I wasn't aware of that. I didn't follow it too closely. Um, I I think you know there's probably arguments for both sides in that one in terms of um, Facebook um, being able to generate traffic for itself by providing those links. But um, yeah, it's not. I'm not going to die on a hill over that. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I, won't, I won't get a get a, a check from from Facebook, and uh, uh, Mr. Barry, Mr. Barry won't. Well, it's a New Zealand publication. No, no. Well, God, I I I got to uh, make sure I'm still getting uh, checks at all, and that I'm not deplatformed by YouTube. Yeah, you, you didn't get any of the the sweet bailout money. No, no, no. I just got um, banned by Twitter. <laughs> yes, I, I because I when I, when I was preparing for the, the the show, I clicked on all your links, and then I clicked on your Twitter and said account suspended. And I was thinking, what did you do? Um, I shared um, some tweets questioning the election result. Just um, initially. Oh yes, uh, which election result? Well, the U.S. presidential election. Yes, yes, very, 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 very bad. Yeah, capital crime on Twitter now. Yeah, so, I, I, I'm surprised you didn't get sued for a billion dollars. <laughs> oh, that would be fun, wouldn't it? But, um, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, going off topic a little here, but um, and can the cancel culture is something that I think um, the right is getting very, very wrong in politics these days. Um, freedom of speech is not an entitlement to a platform, um, and deplatforming as much as I generally hate it, because the people that do it are generally wankers, um, it is really uh, free markets at work on a social level. Um, it's private property rights, it's freedom of association, and it's, well, it's still freedom of speech, because one of the things that I mention when I sell freedom of speech these days is um, your, that whether you like the speech or not, you've got the freedom to criticise it, um, to highlight it, or to boycott um, those people who use it to say things that you disagree with. So I think that the centre-right has really um, got it wrong in its opposition to cancel culture. It's, I believe in fostering a culture of free speech, not just standing for... The, the the free speech in in principle and that was one of my motivations for starting the unshackled is because I wanted to report the news uh, interview people who weren't being uh, fa uh, fairly covered uh, on the, the the mainstream media and yes that inevitably got it got me smeared by uh, guilt by association uh, there's this uh, labor senator Christina Keneally who was she's called she's called she's called the unshackled both an alt-right media platform and far-right media platform because I've interviewed these uh, all, 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 all these uh, people who've been declared uh, extremists uh, but if we if we don't def defend free speech for well, I don't like the word extremists now because it's so overused if we don't defend free speech for radicals I think that's a that's a better term then eventually if the the radicals are, are silenced cancelled then they're, they're going to come uh, for the, uh, the the people closer to the well the uh, the, the the side uh, that is in the minority yeah and um when free speech took off in New Zealand, um, I spoke at the first rally um, defending uh, Lauren Southern and Stephen Mullen, who's uh, right to speak. And, you know, there were people at that rally that I definitely do not um, share political ideologies with. Um, that we would generally be quite opposed to each other. Um, I thought that was the whole point of speaking at a free speech rally. I was more than happy to uh speak at a rally attended by people that disagree with me that's the whole point um, but of course then the lazy uh, left 
and instantly said, oh, well, you're a right-wing extremist, you're a white <laughs> supremacist, um, you know, having a homosexual, uh, being homosexual with a um, Filipino husband just as the equivalent of saying I have black friends. Uh, well, you look at Angie No, uh, he's a, a gay Asian um, who's dedicated his life to exposing Antifa, but he's like literally uh, the, the Antifa and the online communist number one enemy. They've showed up to his house tormenting him, bashed him in the in the in the street he certainly doesn't get a pass no no and it, uh, it, it, it's really just speaks to a um a decline in um political articulation that i think has started with the universities um we saw this happening uh, six seven years ago in the states possibly earlier than i saw it um, and I thought it was a another uniquely American thing, but we've found that over the years, New Zealand tends to be about two or three years behind these, and now we're, we're also burdened with the SJW cancer, um, and it's also made its way into our parliament, and um, it's become popularised amongst uh, young radicals, whereas, you know, I, I remember when I was young, uh, being in favour of free speech was was popular and radical. In Australia, the, the centre-right, the Conservatives, they, they do put up a, a reasonable fight. Uh, obviously, they're, they're, there's still some mainstream media which, uh, which, uh, li which can be quite radical from time to time, such as uh, Sky News Australia commentators, such as uh, Alan Jones and, and, and Rowan Dean and, and Rita, Rita Panicky. Uh, but there, there's certain. Obviously, they they have their uh, their limits. Uh, the, the Sky News uh, Australia they they should obviously uh, they should get credit for uh, having Lauren Southern as a contributor, uh, despite constantly the the Antifa activists saying, "Look, she's doing the 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 OK sign uh, with these uh, local white nationalists during uh, her tour. How can she be on Sky News? How can Barnaby Joyce be on the same panel as her?" And so. That not all hope is lost that she's still on Sky News and uh, uh, they can't stand it and Sky News isn't caving in and cucking. Yeah, yeah, and I guess it, um, you know, there's, a, there's always going to be a market for that sort of approach and, um, you know, thank, thank fuck for a, a free market in the media because um, the, the profit motive is probably one of the best defences we've got against the government tyranny. Um. Uh, unfortunately, though, uh, that uh, that well, free market uh, that that free market doesn't doesn't work as it should be because it's being manipulated somewhat uh, by these Antifa groups who just bombard uh, various advertisers and companies with tweets and emails and that. And so the the HR managers, usually some young woke person from from university, are like, "Oh shit, there's all these. We better uh, cancel this person's account, disavow them, and that." Which is not the the free market working. That's uh, that that's it being manipulated. Like the people who say, "I'm never going to buy your." pillows again they probably never bought any of their pillows but a local small business say for example which is targeted oh you had uh, like the 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 proud boys uh uh like dying in there like and they get all these negative reviews that they generally freak fr freaked out by that and uh, don't don't know what to what to do in that situation because they're suddenly getting all these negative reviews and that's a manipulation of the the market. Yeah, well, defamation is, isn't um, part of the free market. It's not a legitimate part. Uh, it's tricky in the sense that uh, defamation um, processes really only protect those who have the financial means to prosecute them, unfortunately. Um, but I guess it's one of the tricky things for libertarians uh, when speaking to non-libertarians as well as the, the argument that something doesn't work um, but you've got to define what work is and 
another um, Achilles heel for libertarianism is that um, work is usually defined by the means, not the ends. So if um, everyone gets fat because they eat shit in a free market, that's actually the free market working as opposed to um, everyone making healthy, rational choices that are good for them. Well, in that regard, the, the market tends to, well, people correct themselves by, yeah, like it's not fun being fat and lacking energy. And so uh, yeah, now we're having to pay your medical bills. Yeah. And so now we've yeah. seen the massive explosion in 24 hour gyms all over the place. Nearly every suburb now has it as a, as a 24 hour gym. Yeah. I, I, have faith in the market uh, to correct eventually, but you're always going to get um, the some negative results which uh, require the correction. Um, the most important part is to ensure that the market can act is actually free enough to correct, um, as opposed to say the housing market in New Zealand, in which it's um, distorted by. Uh, over regulation, planning rules, uh, land supply rules, blah, 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 blah. And then people propose more regulations to deal with this market that's not working. Now, even though uh, libertarian parties uh, are gaining more traction and more people are, are rediscovering their ideas of liberty, uh, they're still, uh, to, 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 uh, to use the, uh, the current phrase, overwhelming majority of people in Western nations are sheeple and are just happy to comply with uh, the lockdowns for the, well, uh, the, uh, because it's based on, on public health advice. And this is the other thing, the tyranny of the, the, the medical experts, politicians justify these things. Well, it was advised by the, the public health team who are unelected people. They may be experts in, in certain fields of medicine, uh, but that shouldn't give them the right to make uh, decisions for millions of people. And uh, this was played out in the, the WA state election, where, as you can see, Labor Premier Mark McGowan f currently on 51 out of 59 seats, Liberal Party on two, uh, National Party on four, and Aaron Stonehouse, the Liberal Democrat from that state, doesn't look like getting back in the, the upper house. Yeah, and um, yeah, this is a quite dangerous in the sense that if you have a particular qualification, um, voters will, on the whole, unquestionably accept what you propose. Um, maybe I'm a little biased because I never went to university, but um, as cli climate scientists, we need to uh, tax these activities and bring in regulations on other activities to stop um climate change taking effect. Um, I, I don't question your um, nous when it comes to predicting the weather, um, but knowledge of climate does not equal econ uh, being an economist or a politician or a policy expert. And it's one thing to know that hot and cold results in a particular sort of weather. It's another thing entirely to know how to use public policy and regulation to achieve a particular type of weather. Well, I've thoroughly enjoyed chatting with you, uh, Stephen. Uh, I know it's I getting know. close to midnight over in Auckland there. It must really, uh, I think, suck that when, it, when the clock strikes midnight in uh, New Zealand, the rest of the world is just getting up. <laughs> I, I think that's probably why we, we uh, have so much ingenuity because we've got about 10 hours ahead of everyone else. <laughs> Maybe. So your show is on YouTube. Just, well, it's, uh, it's a pretty easy search. Just Mr. Barry, Mr. Barry. Yep, there's only one of it. <laughs> Which, which, which is always good if you have a unique thing. And the, so it's just impossible for the algorithm to hide it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess I like to call it New Zealand political comedy. Um, may, may, maybe I try to do too many things and do an average job of them all. People will just have to search for the show on YouTube and make up their own minds. Yeah, and I encourage them to to do show because uh, the 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 show it's 
full of berry energy. Uh, it's, a, it's a high-paced, enthusiastic show. Yeah, I well, let some um, after years of saying um, what I was expected to say and now the freedom of saying whatever the fuck I like. Yeah, you're, you're unshackled to, to use <laughs> I, a I pun. certainly am. All right, take care, uh, Stephen. Hopefully I can meet up with you in person if this trans-Tasman travel bubble ever ever gets up and is not ruined by one case here or there. I'd look forward to it. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.